there is a battle brewing in the United States. 1,500 book bans in schools across the U.S. Conservative wave of suppression. Especially those that feature LGBTQ youth or talk about the impact of racism. There's nothing like making something forbidden. This is what sent Rushdie underground. Banned Books Week is a global phenomenon. It's become a global phenomenon and it is an event that celebrates the freedom to read and the right to expression and the freedom to consume literature, inform ourselves, educate ourselves, access knowledge and ultimately shape ourselves and shape society. Bringing the literary community together to fight censorship. And this year, Banned Books Week feels especially important because more books were banned in US schools in the last year alone than in the previous three years. So something's going on in the last year. Censorship is becoming an escalating problem in the 21st century. It's always been there. It's never gone away. And by the looks of it, it's not going to go away anytime soon. Why does it still happen? Well, because people have always pushed back against social progress. Because people are afraid. They make up excuses. They call it propaganda. They call it obscenity. They call it left-wing drivel. They call it woke politics. They'll call it whatever they want to spin the narrative and make it seem like these are books that don't belong in classrooms, that don't belong in schools, don't belong in libraries, don't belong in readers' hands. By suppressing knowledge like that, we are going to hinder and harm people more than help them. Right to expression and the freedom to read are absolute foundations for modern Western society. And yet we're still talking about suppression and censorship because it's still happening. It's still happening in the 21st century. We're still seeing people being denied the right to read books, denied the right to express themselves, denied the their access to knowledge. We should be opening up people's opportunities to learn about anything, whether it be history, whether it be fiction, whatever it is that someone is trying to access. And yet there are still people censoring and challenging and banning books in schools, in libraries, even still in countries because they are obscene, because they challenge ideas, because they are propaganda. A bunch of reasons that really don't make sense. Without access to these books, students can't develop critical thinking skills. Young people can't learn about themselves and their identity. They can't express themselves in the real modern world. We should be facilitating these things in our society. We should be guiding people and helping people so that they can learn, they can make choices, they can discover their identity, they can develop critical thinking skills. We need to fight censorship. We need to be able to write what we want to write, say what we want to say. As creators and as readers, we need to be able to read these books if we want to move into the future, if we want to actually build a more progressive world. But anyway, I'm not just here to rant. I'm actually here to showcase five different books that have been banned throughout history because... I think it's really interesting to have a look at the reasons why certain books were banned in certain periods of time and perhaps consider what these censors, what these people who were challenging these books were thinking about these banned books, but also consider the impact that preventing someone from reading these books will have on groups of people who can't read them, who can't access them. The first book we have is The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. When this book was first published in 1890, it was met with uproar for being homoerotic, full of immoral influences and suggestive, whatever that means. Much of this was actually directed at Wilde's own homosexuality, rather than the themes that were in the novel. It was described in the Daily Chronicle in 1890 as having one element which will taint every young mind that comes in contact with it. Five years later, Oscar Wilde was actually brought to trial for gross indecency, and Dorian Gray was used against him in court. He was imprisoned for two years, and when he was finally released, he fled for France, and never returned to the UK. I recently discovered that an uncensored version of this book was eventually published, but the versions most of us read are actually the censored version of A Picture of Dorian Gray. So these are the lingering after effects of censorship, the hangover, if you will, of a book that was censored well over a hundred years ago now. The next book we have is The Satanic Verses by Salman Rushdie. Salman Rushdie's 1988 novel was loaded with controversy. 
This has become known as the ongoing Rushdie Affair. It was banned in several countries, but nowhere did it come under scrutiny more than Iran. The novel was branded blasphemous by Muslim groups for using Islam as satire and for portraying the Prophet as irreverent, triggering violent protests, public outrage, and book burnings. A religious decree called a fatwa was issued against Rushdie, which encouraged people to assassinate him, along with his editors and his publishers. Diplomatic relations between the United Kingdom and Iran were shattered. Rushdie went into hiding under police protection. More than 20 assassination attempts were made against Rushdie, the most recent making global headlines in August 2022 when Rushdie was stabbed during a public lecture in New York. Not to mention in 1991 Rushdie's Japanese translator was actually stabbed to death and his Italian translator was seriously wounded in another assassination attempt. Rushdie has claimed that he still receives death threats and reminders that the fatwa still stands. Now it's true that there are elements of the satanic verses that might be considered highly offensive to religious groups or they contradict Islamic beliefs, but the Rushdie affair actually raises questions around the Western notions of freedom of expression and open criticism without persecution. I found this quote by Salman Rushdie that I think is really cool and is a good statement about the entire Rushdie affair. The moment you say that any idea system is sacred, whether it's a religious belief system or a secular ideology, the moment you declare a set of ideas to be immune from criticism, satire, derision or contempt, freedom of thought becomes impossible. American Psycho by Brett Easton Ellis. I already mentioned this one last year, but I thought I'd mention it again because I do work in a bookshop and I've seen a lot of people buying it recently, so I think it's still quite relevant, so I thought I'd talk about it again so that maybe some of the people who have started reading it this year can learn reasons why the book was banned in the first place. I actually have a couple editions of this book because I was really fascinated by the controversy around the book and its uh, availability in certain countries. American Psycho is a social satire in which the psychotic serial killer protagonist, Patrick Bateman, kills people gratuitously out of repressed anger, bred from the patriarchy and corporate culture. The book has been challenged for portraying sadism, murder, abuse, torture, SA and cannibalism. In Victoria, Australia, where I live, American Psycho must be sold in this shrink wrap binding that prevents readers from being able to browse through it and read the pages. It also has a Category 1 restricted label on top of it. ID is required to make a purchase for this book, which I can confirm is a bookseller. I've actually had to turn people away because they don't have ID or because they're too young. The book is also not available for purchase in Queensland. It's banned outright in Queensland. Although I have heard people saying it may be banned in theory, but we have found it on shelves and we have been able to buy it in the shrink wrap as long as you have ID over 18. I really want to know if this book is available for purchase in Queensland because to my knowledge it's currently not available. An interesting fact about this book is that a copy was found by the bedside of serial killer Paul Bernando. So it's alleged that the book could have actually encouraged him to murder people. Some people consider this book a red flag book and they view it as a misogynist novel that celebrates violence instead of an over-exaggerated postmodern satire that discourages toxic masculinity and violence. While the book may have merit as a commentary on society, and it is a good example of writing straight from a character's internal monologue, restricting it from young readers makes sense, since the themes may be distressing to read and may even have the potential to contribute to the, the dangerous incel culture amongst youth men. While I want to say that if a young reader feels mature enough to, you know, decide they want to consume something, they should be able to, this actually raises the questions about young people being able to make the decision to handle such distressing, potentially even traumatic content that could have negative effects on the reader. There are people even identifying or empathizing with the protagonist, which is not the idea of the book. You're not supposed to like Patrick Bateman, but of course there are young people who are out there 
idolizing this man, which is very dangerous. This is a classic case of people not using critical thinking skills when it comes to reading books with distressing content. And so naturally you're gonna have people who completely miss the point of the satire and they model parts of their lives around very toxic characters that are meant to be over exaggerated and over the top that aren't meant to be someone that we really want to care about or become. That is where the danger lies in books like American Psycho which we don't want of course. There's a quote I like that I think is really applicable to American Psycho by Hanya Yanagihara which is, I have always maintained that all kinds of lives belong in fiction including violent lives or ones marked by suffering. Extreme lives, in other words. But extreme lives are all around us every day, and fiction must reflect them too. This next book is The Kite Runner by Khaled Hosseini. The 2003 novel, set in Afghanistan, from the fall of Afghanistan's monarchy to the Soviet invasion and the rise of the Taliban, has been on the American Library Association's top 10 list for challenge books in 2008, 2012, 2014, and again in 2017. Reasons for its challenges include its supposedly offensive language, sexually explicit material, depictions of homosexuality, religious viewpoints, violence, and out of fear that it might inspire terrorism or promote Islam. Most of these bans happened in schools and libraries across the United States. The book has been pulled from curriculums and shelves across the country by teachers, librarians, and parents, fearing the book will have a negative influence on young students. One county disapproved of teaching the book in classrooms, because apparently schools are supposed to teach sex education from a harmful, abstinence-only perspective. Some parents have expressed concern that the essay scene in the novel could cause students who have experienced abuse further trauma. And the last book that I'm going to talk about is The Perks of Being a Wallflower by Stephen Shabosky. The Perks of Being a Wallflower is considered a banned book because it has been challenged and restricted for its depiction of sex, SA, profanity, and the supposed glorification of drugs and alcohol, usually out of fear that these themes will encourage young people to commit crime or abuse fellow students. This book, like some of the others, was mainly challenged in school libraries and classrooms in the United States, but it was one of the most frequently banned books of 2009, according to the American Library Association. This book is a great example for the kind of book we should be using to help students at the appropriate age develop critical thinking skills. The best way to achieve this, of course, is by allowing young persons to access books with challenging content. I thought I'd also mention a few other books that are also widely known banned books that I didn't have time to talk about for this year's banned book video. So we have Boris Pasternak's Doctor Zavago, Philip Roth's Portnoy's Complaint, The Colour Purple by Alice Walker, Another Country by James Baldwin, Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, which coincidentally is, is about book banning and book burning. Lady Chatterley's Lover by D.H. Lawrence. Howl by Allen Ginsberg. George Orwell's Animal Farm. And William S. Burroughs' The Naked Lunch. So that's all I have time for for now, but I hope you enjoyed hearing me talk about these banned books because I'm pretty passionate about banned books because they're something that I started looking into really deeply while I was still in uni studying writing and editing and publishing and I came across the concept of banned books and I thought, hey, that's really interesting. I don't hear enough people talking about this. Let's start reading banned books. Let's read the classics. Let's read why these books were controversial and learn from them and develop critical thinking skills. And I think some of these books are really essential when it comes to understanding history History, understanding literature and classics, understanding social progress and how we've ended up where we are, which according to this video is not very far because we still have censorship and the suppression of reading to this day. If you get the chance, pick up a banned book this week and give it a try. You might find that you've learned a lot or you enjoyed it or you've opened your mind. You might hate it, but give it a go.